All right. Hey, guys. So I um, wanted to get us started on our unit six. Um, if you've taken honors, most of this should be review and then like a little bit of new stuff at the end. So, you know, do with it what you will. Um, so this is all about energy, thermodynamics. Um, the first thing that is super key that we've all have heard before um, is the, we call it the first law of thermodynamics. This concept you've heard before that energy cannot be created or destroyed. But it can change forms. or be transferred. Or do work. So that's what we're all it's going to all be about. We have to keep track of our energy and like what it's doing, how it's behaving and if it's moving around and well, that's going to be the main focus. So a few like just big concepts that we got to get out of the way so that we can have effective conversations about thermodynamics is, first of all, is heat and temperature the same thing? I mean, just like in your everyday life, maybe you feel like they're the same thing. We're going to do a demo in class that kind of demonstrates this, but in the reality, no, they are not. Heat and temperature are not the same. Um, the temperature of something, the temperature of something, like we've talked about, like that's basically like what we're equating that to when we take a measurement of temperature. It's basically just measuring the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of all the particles in the space. So as long as temperature, that's just like a measurement um, of that. And it's a physical property. that we can measure. Yep. So physical property, it's like something can be a certain temperature. Um, and the units on this, there's a few of them. We use Celsius quite a lot. We pretty much never use Fahrenheit. And we also use Kelvin. All three of those we might see. But what is the heck is heat? Heat is different. Heat is not a measurement. Like when I say it's like 30 degrees outside, I can't like measure heat like that. It's not measurable directly. We can only figure out the heat based on other things we can measure. So you don't measure it directly. What we are talking about when we're talking about heat, heat is a movement. of thermal energy so when we get like a value for heat um we're getting a value for how much energy is transferred or energy transfer So like you're going to see in class, when we actually like feel something and it feels hot, it's not because its temperature is a certain amount of degrees. It's that the hot energy is being transferred to your hand. So the heat is like, that's actually what we experience, but it's actually kind of a separate concept. So the movement of thermal energy, the movement of temperature or not of temperature of that energy is what we experience as heat. So two separate things, like a value on a thermometer versus the actual movement of the thing. And since it's a separate thing, it also has separate units. Our units for this, for us, it's usually going to be joules or kilojoules. You know, we could always just throw a metric thing in there. So same thing, but a thousand, uh, a th this one is a thousand times bigger. Um, or we could have we don't really use it very often, but calories, like when on the back of a package it says something has a certain amount of calories, it's communicating how much energy you're going to get from it. 
So this is a value about energy versus just that physical property of temperature. So heat is the real thing that we um, care about a lot of the time. That's like when we're talking about heat transfer, which is going to be our big focus. That's what we're focusing in on. Um, and if I want to talk about any thermal energy that moving, is moving around, any heat, the thing I will use to represent it is a lowercase q. So we're going to have a bunch of lowercase q's to represent this. Um, drawing isn't like as big a thing in this one, like for if you care about the AP test, like they don't test you on that as much, but I think it's helpful to understand these things if you're able to draw them. So when I draw things, at least, I'm going to show the movement of heat with a squiggly arrow. So you might see that. So Q is heat. <laughs> and then like a very similar but slightly different thing. If you have um, a system, which we're going to define in a second, if you have a system and that thing experiences a change in heat, a change in energy, there's a special name for that. And it is called enthalpy, because of course it is. Obviously, it's called enthalpy. Enthalpy. And that is represented as an H. And if we're talking about the change in enthalpy, which is usually what we care about, we're talking about delta H. Um, just a side note, you might see this with a little circle, it's called a knot. If, it, if the reaction or whatever is performed at one degree, sorry, one ATM and 298 Kelvin, then we get our delta H with a little knot. So if it is performed under those conditions, then that's what's called. So if you see that, that's just what we're referring to. Um, and like all the differences is that that little knot means it's standard. So we see that on a lot of stuff sometimes. If you see the little knot, it just means standard. So standard. Um, so just whether like if I actually measure my delta H, I'd probably get like some delta H. But if I looked at like a textbook and it gave me a number, it'd probably be my standard value. So that's the only difference. Um, so the different, so Q is any heat transfer. Enthalpy is specifically talking about the total change in energy, the net energy change in my system. So uh, what, the, what the heck is a system? Um, it's like this vague nebulous concept, at least for me. Um, we can kind of define our system however we want, so it can vary what our system is. Um, it's kind of like you just define the system as whatever is helpful for you. So I kind of think of it as like whatever key stuff is interacting. So whatever we define that is, is the system. So whatever things we call the system, that's our system. And usually we're focusing in on like whatever thing I like care about that I want to like analyze the heat transfer of, that's probably what I'm going to call my system. So sometimes, just to give you some visuals, like, yeah. Like, I don't know, let's say I got like a cup of water and I wanted to know like, what's up with the water? What's it doing? If it's like sitting in the room, is it interacting with the room? So maybe sometimes I'll call my system like the whole cup. So a lot of the time that's what we'll do. We call the system like the, the whole reaction vessel. So if something's in a beaker, maybe the system is everything inside the beaker, that kind of thing. And anything that's not your system is the surroundings. The system and the surroundings. Um, and a lot of the time there's going to be these interactions between the systems and the surroundings. Um, I think if you've taken physics, they've talked about it a bit. Um, most of the time it's not a perfectly isolated system. So most of the time it's an open system or maybe a closed system in which there's some kind of interactions between these. So 
matter or heat. Can move between. System and surroundings. So that's sometimes helpful. Sometimes, like if I just am talking about like something sitting out in a room, I care about its interactions with this room as the surroundings. So, like my system would just be my cup. But a lot of the time, like especially if we're talking about a reaction. Maybe we want to define our system a little bit differently. So just to give you like a different example of what we might do, um, sometimes maybe it's more helpful to focus in on the interactions within the beaker. So let's say I had a beaker and inside the beaker, there's some, I don't know, let's say there's like a reaction going on and I want to focus on the effect of the reaction. Maybe I define my system as the reaction. And maybe I define my surroundings as like the solution. And again, there's still these interactions happening between the two, but that's also an option. So we'll, we'll practice this. Like we're gonna do some labs where we see a few different applications of this. Um, but a lot of the time, like the main experiment we're gonna do um, we're actually going to define it this way. So focusing in on one thing that's happening inside our cup versus, and then how is that affecting like the water, usually the surroundings, the solvent. Um, and because there's these interactions, the heat and the matter are moving in between the two. Often it's helpful to make measurements about the surroundings. Or I'll say to get data about the system. So I'll define that a bit more clearly later, but just so you know, we know this interaction is happening. And so if we understand what's happening to one piece, we can figure out what's happening with the other one. There's also some other concept called work. So these are kind of just the two forms of like what energy can do. Either energy can be transferred as heat, at least for us, those are the two types. Energy can be transferred as heat or energy can do work. So it's just, again, a kind of like, it's just a thing that energy can do. And it's what it sounds like. It does work, like it does some function. Um, they're just kind of two things about energy. So the change in energy of the system could be made up of the heat and the work if it's doing work. Now this is like not a big thing for us, but like I see it vaguely mentioned like once or twice. So I just wanna mention it, but it's not gonna come up that much. So work, we're talking about any form of energy transfer that's not heat. So I don't know, like I can only think of like physics, like and now I can't think of like the words for physics. Yeah, no, I, I'm not gonna pretend that I can come up with the correct vocabulary for that, but I don't know, some other type of energy transfer that's not heat. Um, and there's just kind of two things that can happen. So if the system is doing the work, she's doing the work, um, it's causing some kind of change in your surroundings, then we say that the that work is being done by the system. The system does the work. Um, it means that the like we're affecting our surroundings in some way. Um, and I'll clarify, we'll do, see a picture in a second, but um, if this is the case, then work is negative. Any energy that is leaving my system doing other stuff is a negative change. Okay. Um, so the only real application that is like a thing for this is the expansion of a gas. So like, let's say a gas like started moving more. 
and so suddenly it's like that pressure is building let's say it had like a lid but the gas is expanding it's getting more pressure or like if there was a reaction making it so there was more gas work would be done to move that lid up force it up because the gas expanded that's that's really the only application of this for us and again pretty rare to come up but just a thing that can happen work is being done on the surroundings because the system the gas is causing this change causing the um, lid to be forced bigger versus if work is done to the system so if something happens to my system we're adding energy to the system that is a positive change in the system's energy aka if we went the other way and we like compress that gas if i forced my lid down suddenly that energy would be going back into the system okay so we've talked about endo and exothermic before but these are going to continue to be a huge thing. So I kind of want to give a summary. There's lots of different things we could bring up with exo and endothermic. So here's your big old summary of like all the things about both so that we can apply them later. So the big overarching thing that I'm just going to write at the top, endothermic by definition, that is any time that, I guess energy, but for us, it's usually going to be heat. So I'm going to say heat. move is absorbed by by the system heat is being added to our system there's more heat now so this is a positive change in energy So let's look back at those graphs that we've done a whole bunch. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be bad and not label my axes, but this is our potential energy diagram. You can look back at previous notes if you wanna label them. Um, and let's just draw this, we've drawn it before. If it's an endothermic thing, it's gonna look something like this. Our, my products are gonna be higher up than my um, reactants. They have more energy than my reactants. So this is always your change in energy from um, that the system undergoes. And now we know that the special word for that is enthalpy. So the change in energy for the system, the net change is the enthalpy, delta H. And what you can see in this picture is now it has more energy. So this was a positive change. It got more energy. Okay. So let's flip that around. XO is just the opposite. Oh my God, please. Okay. Okay. So if something is exothermic, that means that heat is uh, uh, released by the system. So energy is moving outside of my system. So that is a negative change in my energy. So that means that your graph would instead look like this. Starting with a certain amount of energy, going over my activation energy, and having less energy by the end. A change in energy from my reactants to my products that is negative. A delta H in enthalpy change that is negative. So representing that change that the system underwent from the process. Okay, something that is a little bit new to us um, is the concept that something with less potential energy, so something lower on these graphs, less potential energy, that means more stable. So lower potential energy means more stable. So generally, if something can get to a lower potential energy state, that's going to be something it wants to do. So generally, my endothermic processes are going to be unfavorable.
as you got because you have to like put in more energy you're going to a higher potential energy so you'd have to put in a lot of work you'd have to put in potential energy in order to do this versus exothermic things are often favorable because moving to that lower energy state is makes it more stable So with this, if you have like numbers associated with these, so like if you had a delta H of negative 50 versus negative 500, the more negative one we're talking about a more favorable change if we're talking about our delta H. Generally. Now there is a lot more complexity to this, but we'll get into that in like unit nine, but for now. Generally, if we're just talking about the heat, they generally want to become more stable. So here's another visual of that. Um, like, let's say we have a system here. If it is endothermic, that means that heat is coming in to my system. So from the surroundings, we're adding in heat, which means we would get a positive value for our cues. Again, a positive change in the Q. And we're looking at it from the system's perspective. The system is getting more energy, a positive Q. Or if I was doing work on my system, I'd be adding energy into my system. A positive work. Versus if I have an exothermic thing going on, my system is going to be the one giving off that heat. So if it's giving off heat, that would be a negative value for Q, losing that heat energy. Or if it was doing some work, that would be a negative value for my work. There's also, so there's also things that are like observable about each one. If energy is being absorbed by my um, system, that means that it's taking energy from the surroundings. So that means that when I try to touch it, it's going to feel cold. Because it's taking energy from the surroundings. It's going to feel cold to me because it's taking energy from my hand if I try to touch it. It's taking that energy away. We'll talk more about that in class that I hope will help. Um, another concept is the concept that breaking chemical bonds or like interactions like IMFs requires energy. Okay. So we'll come back to that one in a bit. Um, it will be more important later when we talk about reactions, but just a concept that is going to kind of guide us. Um, so something observable on the outside is that temperature difference, or, you know, like what we're experiencing as a heat difference when you touch it. It's going to feel cold if it's endothermic. Um, and if you have to break any bonds, that is going to be an endothermic process. It'll take energy. Versus if you have a system that is releasing energy, That means it's going to feel hot. So all that heat is going to the outside and then suddenly you put your hand by it, you're gonna feel that heat coming off. Okay. And if I form new bonds or interactions, then you get to release heat. That is an exothermic process.
Okay. So again, we'll keep coming back to these. They just might be something that, you know, a good grounding for us, a kind of summary of those things. Now, the thing about this is um, these can be physical processes where there's a heat transfer, or it can be a chemical change that involves a heat transfer. Both can involve heat transfer. Um, that therefore we can have endo or and we could put exo or endothermic as like a label on either process. So we're going to see some examples of both. Um, either type can be endo or exothermic. They're not. We're back to that weird example of dissolution dissolving something. I just didn't know where else to put it, so I'm going to throw it in here um because that's what they did so i don't know let's just talk about it um just because it's a weird example and it will come up again um ionic dissolution so you might remember that that is our weird example that is like kind of both so it's not just um it's not just a strictly chemical change it's not strictly a physical change it's kind of both um and so here's another thing that like makes it kind of weird um so when we dissolve salts you probably don't you know, you don't really think about that because you're just like, oh, well, there's like salt in the ocean. It just dissolves on its own. But a lot of the time there's actually energy involved in that process. So we can observe. Actually, they often can observe. But the weird thing about it is sometimes um, when you dissolve salt, it feels cold. And sometimes when you dissolve salt, it feels hot. So these aren't like strictly one way or the other. They could be either depending on how they work. So why is that? Um, like, why would it be that there is sometimes it feels hot, sometimes it feels cold? Like, what would the difference be? Um, and what we need to think about, this is actually a two-step process, um, as we've talked about before. First, you're breaking the interactions in your solid, right? So if I had this solid lattice, I have to break up these positive and negatives, break them apart, break those ionic um, Coulomb's attractions, break the lattice energy. And breaking bonds like we just talked about, that process is um, would take energy. That is an endo process. And then once you break them up, once you dissolve them in the water, they don't just stay on their own. They form interactions with the water, right? We've seen this before. So two-step process, we break those up and then we get to form ion dipole. with the water because we're dissolving it. And that process, when we form new interactions, is exothermic. So that's like what it kind of comes down to. We'll talk more about like that balance um, when we do more with chemical reactions also. But kind of weird. We can kind of see both. It's because of these two separate processes happening. Um, so this is another reason why some people are, are like why it doesn't fit well in either thing we're not actually making new substances it's still just na plus and cl minus but there's an energy change so that's another reason why these have both characteristics of chemical and physical changes okay so some things just to give you a question about this um again just because i didn't know where else to throw it um 
So let's think about this. We got the lattice energy. So a reminder, that means the energy to make our lattice. To form the ionic bonds, basically. It is a combination of steps. Um, or, sorry, we are just talking about the last energy, energy, which is right here. Um, that's the last energy they're referring to. And then they're saying that we have a bunch of steps to try to determine the enthalpy. And then it's asking which step is a valid explanation. So often we'll do this, like enthalpy is, you know, it's very hard to actually determine the enthalpy overall. Um, so a lot of the time we're kind of break it down into steps like this. So let's consider these processes. So, you know, as usual, just like good multiple choice skills, kind of like let's focus on like what the question is and what your options are. And then we'll look back at the resources if we have to. So process one is endothermic because energy is released when the attractions are broken. First of all, endothermic, what does that mean? It means that energy is absorbed. So already, that's just not true. You don't even need to look at the reactions. It's just like, do you know the definitions? Um, okay, this one says, it, second one is exothermic because it has a low electronegativity. And you might also notice that this one says exothermic because it has a high electronegativity. Now that, like this is very speculative. Um, so I think a lot of people get like kind of bogged down in those as options, but like these are not good answer choices because they're very speculative. There might be some correlation, there might be some correlation, but it's not a good explanation of the causation of enthalpy, which is what we wanna focus on. So not good options. Well, that doesn't make that much sense. Let's focus more on like what would cause the energy to be positive or negative. This one says endothermic because energy is required to break the bonds. So that's going to be your answer. Um, so focusing more on like what is actually involved, um, what is it taking to make it endo or exothermic. So electronegativity, maybe that will involve like the strength of the bond, but like eh, it's it, that would be like it's very hard to actually pin down. Let's focus in on just like exactly what endothermic means. We want to focus on the forming or breaking of interactions. Okay. We observe a decrease in temperature when something is dissolved. The student makes the following conclusion. The decrease in temperature indicates that the system is losing heat, suggesting that the process is exothermic. So maybe pause and think about this. Let me draw you a little picture to kind of help with this. Um, I'm just gonna show, uh, just show some stuff dissolved in here, okay? And it's forming those interactions, but I don't really care about showing those right now. <laughs> oh, oh boy, um, people have had me before now. I'm really good at drawing hands. Let's see how I do. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> Try one more time. Probably not going to be good. Yeah, that's fine. Um, You know, close enough. So let's say you put your hand up to the solution. Okay. And there is a decrease in temperature. It feels cold. It feels cold. Um, The surroundings have lost energy. Okay, so this is like the part that I feel like we can get mixed up on. What you're actually measuring, if the temperature decreases, if I feel that it has a lower temperature now, that means that the um, that heat has been lost from my surroundings where I'm measuring the temperature. If I put my hand up to it, my hand is going to feel cold because 
heat is being taken from my hand and being stolen and going into my system. So just because the temperature um, is decreasing, that doesn't mean that the process is exothermic. It means that it's actually endothermic. Um, you could also think about it. I'm just going to stick with this for now. Um, there's other ways we could draw our system, but I feel like this is okay. Um, so actually it is endothermic. Because the system So again, so whatever is easier for you to like visualize as the system is what you want to make your system. So you could think of it as like the ions in the solution. So the ions specifically, which I think might be helpful as our system um, have gained energy. Or you could think of it as like the solution has gained energy, whatever is easier for you to visualize. But the system has gained So if there's an increase in temperature, we have added, or sorry, if there's an increase in temperature, um, like for this kind of thing when we're dissolving stuff, um, if it feels hot, then we have given off heat. If it feels cold, we have put heat in. Okay, heat transfer. So kind of alluding to that up here, but this is just a general concept. I'm going to draw, let's imagine we have two boxes. And one box has... Um, hot gas. So I'm just going to draw some particles. I'm going to draw them moving around a lot because they're hot. So let's just imagine we had that, and then we had a box of cold gas, which was not moving around as much because it's cold and has a lower average kinetic energy. When these two come into contact with each other, it's not going to work. When they come into contact with each other, then heat transfer can occur. And when I say this, um, they just basically need contact with each other. So if the collision thing confuses you, then think of it as just they need to be touching. Um, but in order for transfer to actually happen, like those particles need to interact somehow. So that can be direct or indirect, like in here, there's still a wall. Um, but as the gas hits the wall, like maybe they hit the wall at the same time or like some energy is transferred from box to box. Um, so if two things of different temperatures are in contact with each other, then heat transfer occurs. And heat transfer always happens from the hot thing to the cold thing. I totally forgot that the key idea was right there. That's what I meant. You can put it somewhere else if you want. We're just showing that all of my heat has been transferred or my heat begins to transfer from the hot thing to the cold thing. Now, some concept, if these things have been in contact for long enough, then 
at a certain point, like I keep transferring my heat to my cold thing and I keep doing that and I keep doing that. And at a certain point, they end up at the same temp, same average kinetic energy. So my hot thing has lost some energy. My cold thing has gained some energy. But now they have the same temperature. So they're both, I don't know, medium <laughs> gases. Once there is no difference in temperature, then no heat transfer occurs. So there's actually a concept called thermal equilibrium. So just like our reactions, in reality, it doesn't actually stop. They're still like interacting in this way. They still have this contact, but it's going back and forth at the exact same rate. So it's as if they just stay the same temp. I'm just gonna say it's no heat transfer for our purposes. They're just at the same temp and we're done with the heat transfer. And so we can measure that point at which all of the energy has been transferred when the temperature stops changing. Okay, so we've been talking about this concept of Q, concept of heat transfer as a big thing, but um, there's a lot of cool math that we can do with this. What if we actually want numbers for this? There's two main ways that we're gonna think about this. If it is from, if it's just like hot thing, cold thing, and it's just them like transferring heat. So in this one, no reaction has happened. No phase change happened. Nothing actually changed about the gases. We just transferred temperature. We just transferred heat. Then one way we can find our Q, our heat transfer is by using the temperature change. So Q, and then there's this lovely equation, M cat. Q is equal to M cat, where Q is our heat. So usually going to be joules. M is the mass of whatever thing is transferring, or, you know, whatever thing we're looking at. So usually in grams. Delta T is the change in temperature. And the thing about this is just for chemistry, whenever you see a delta, it always means that change. And for us, it always is final minus initial. That does matter. Final minus initial. So sometimes it will be negative, and that's what you want. You want to keep track of that. Final minus initial. And usually this could be in degrees Celsius. It could be different though. And C is a thing called our heat capacity. You might hear it called specific heat capacity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, but its units might be something like this. Now, um, these units can vary. So like, if this was kilojoules, you would have to be super careful that this number was also kilojoules. You have to make sure these units talk to each other. If this was kilograms, you'd probably need to change it to grams before you plugged it in. If this was Kelvin, you'd want to make sure that matched there. So be careful. There are a lot of different units, but it will look something like this usually. So this is going to be a super common thing. We will practice with it in a moment. So that's a super one, a, a very common one, just measuring how much heat was transferred based on being able to measure a temperature change. Um, we also might want to be able to quantify how much heat comes from a physical or chemical process. So that can be a reaction or it could be a phase change, something like that. And in that case, Q is equal to N delta H where this is the enthalpy, aka our change in heat, for the system.
you know, so there will, subscripts are going to be a big thing because there's a lot to keep track on. So keep track of. So if it says reaction, we're probably talking about a chemical reaction or there could be something else there to indicate it's a phase change, but I'll show you that when we practice it in a sec. And N is our moles. It's back. It's N again. And Q is heat. So this, the enthalpy of a reaction is usually going to be measured in either kilojoules or joules per mole. I'll just say joules per mole, but again, be careful. It could be different. So usually we'll put it per mole. So every time the reaction happens, like how many moles of reactions have happened. And then that's moles. So the unit's moles so that those cancel out and your unit over here is going to be joules or kilojoules usually for us. <sighs> Okay, heat transfer, or heat capacity and calorimetry. Okay, so what the heck is that weird C value? Um, you know, I'm all about units. So let's kind of take a look at the units on heat capacity to kind of dissect that a little bit. Usually our units, and again, they can vary, but something like this, you're gonna have joules per gram degrees Celsius. So what that's actually communicating to you is the energy, or I'll say the heat needed to change the temperature of a one gram sample by one degree Celsius. So if those were the units, that's what this is communicating. The heat to change a sample, one gram of a sample by one degree Celsius. So I gotta, I feel like that helps me remember like what this is actually showing me. So to just give you a little definition for this, what if I'm talking about heat capacity, it's a property of a substance. Which indicates how much heat is required. to change its temperature. That's not the right thing. Okay. Um, so if something has a low heat capacity, that means that it um, will change and uh, temperature very easily. It will change temperature quickly and easily. Versus if you have something with a high heat capacity. It'll change, it'll only change temp, or I'll say it requires more heat. So that's what heat capacity is. How, uh, like, how much are we going to see that temperature change? How quickly does the temperature change happen? Um, is basically what you can think of it as. So let's look at this table. And again, this is an example of how those units on heat capacity might be a little different. Sometimes it might be per mole instead of per gram. Sometimes the temperature is going to be measured in Kelvin, but same idea, heat capacity. The which metal would need to absorb the most heat in order to raise, raise its measured temperature. So let's look at these values. And the answer is the one that will take the most heat is going to be your biggest number. So aluminum, and let's kind of write it down words. Aluminum needs 
And let's look at the units. 0 0.897 joules to change the temperature of a sample. by one Kelvin. So I feel like writing it out like that might help us see it. So in order to change the temperature of aluminum, I'm gonna need to transfer that many joules of energy versus one of these guys, like this one. I only need to transfer 0.129 joules of energy to, right, to change its temperature. So Aluminum requires the most energy. It has the highest heat capacity, which means it will take the most energy. So something like that, high heat capacity means that it will take the most energy. Okay, so there is one key lab technique that we use in, if we want to actually study heat transfer and it's called calorimetry. So we have those equations about Q, but how would we actually make measurements about this? Because like I said, there's no thermometer for heat. Um, we can't just directly measure it. We have to make observations and like actually set up an experiment in order to figure it out. So here's a big concept for calorimetry. And I'll show you a diagram of a calorimeter in a sec. But let's go back to this concept. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, which means that the universe, like whatever heat transfer is happening, whatever interactions are happening, there's no actual change in the energy of like the universe. Like might be moving around, but it's not actually changing. So we could represent that as thinking that any heat absorbed and any heat released must be net to zero because there's no change in the energy of the universe. So whatever interactions happen, whatever heat is moved around, there's no actual overall change. So that means that like what, and these could like, I'll show you like some ways I like to do this. I really like just keeping track of all my separate cues because we're going to see sometimes this gets a little bit more complicated. Maybe there's more than one process going on at a time and you got to keep your cues straight. So I kind of like listening them all like this. So all of the cues, no matter what they are, have to all sum up to zero. But that also means that I can move these around the Q absorbed has to be equal to the negative Q of however much was released, right? Just moving that around. So this will be a very useful concept. Um, what we're saying really here is any heat released would have to be absorbed. Um, a phrase you might hear associated with this is that they're equal and opposite. And again, I think this will make more sense when we actually see some examples, but we could kind of equate this or some people choose to just say like it's make one side the Q of the system, like assuming that all of the heat is the system and then all one side the surroundings. Um, so that's also an option, but again, we'll, I'll clarify that in a sec. Okay, so we have this concept that all heat transferred must be absorbed elsewhere. There's no actual change in R um energy of our universe so if we look at a calorimeter what the heck is that i'll show you a diagram in a sec but it's just kind of a thing we set up where we assume it's a perfectly closed system which means no heat transferred to the greater surroundings to the universe
which means that we assume that all heat transfer occurs in the calorimeter. So often what we would do, like here, I'll just give you a classic setup that we're gonna do in a bit. Calorimeter, it has like a lid, it's a closed system. And then we usually have water and then we'll put something in the water that will do something. So a lot of the time, like we're gonna do it when we have a, like let's say we put a hot block in here. Um, when that hot block goes in the calorimeter, we're assuming that all of the energy released by the hot thing is going into the water. So all, and the helpful thing that we will do, so or I'll just say, I'm sorry, all, So we can make measurements about this and uh, make um, assumptions or make this assumption where, so that our measurements would relate to being able to quantify the heat released from the block. So let me show you what this would usually look like. Um, this is called a coffee cup cal calorimeter, um, very common. So basically just putting something insulated, so like styrofoam cups and stacking them up. Um, on the outside, and then you put your stuff that you want to react on the inside, and we're assuming that it's staying perfect in there, and the only heat transfer is between our two things. Um, and then we will have a thermometer so that we can measure the temperature change. So a lot of the time, that Q equals MCAT is going to be super important for this, so that we can measure the Q based on the temperature change we read. All right, cool. So we're gonna actually do this lab. So I'll be kind of vague here and you'll see a real ones. We'll see, we're gonna do multiple of them actually. But usually you set up an insulated system. And it varies, but usually what we're using is water. So you add one thing to the calorimeter. We're gonna say water for us. Again, we'll see some variety of this, but. Say we had that. Or maybe it's one reactant if we're measuring a reaction, that kind of thing. Um, okay, and again, we'll see variety, but let's say we say, like what, if I just wanna measure the heat transfer between like an object, let's say we have an add object. With different. Temp to the water. And then we would measure So let's say that that was our setup. Um, there's a lot of nuance to this and we'll see a better example in a bit but um we'll just talk about key measurements so if our goal is to use q equals m cat to figure out our q there are a few key things we need to measure usually we'll measure our initial temp Um, of anything we want to find the Q of. So if there's two substances, we want to find the initial and the final for both.
we would want to find the heat capacity. So usually we'd look that up or maybe that's what we're trying to figure out. You need to measure the mass of both. And then Q, there's nothing to measure that. We just have to calculate that. So that's typically what we'll do. Um, so those are the three key ones is that you need mass and the temperatures. So a lot of the time we'll see some kind of data table that looks like that, where we're getting mass data and temperature data and we're able to use it in our thing. Um, I think I'm gonna pause this here and yeah, you can watch the next one for some more, but thanks for listening.